Welcome to the show, Atul. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you uh, for having me on today. And uh, uh, that was a nice introduction. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you like it. How are you today in Bermuda? Yeah, doing very well. It's a nice day here. It's sunny and it's, uh, it's Friday. So when, uh, when this afternoon is over, um, we might head to the beach with, uh, with our kids. So it's, uh, it's a great day. That. Perfect way to spend your summer. <laughs> now let's start with Cult Wines. Can you give us an overview? I mean, this company has been a while, around for a while. Can you give us an overview of the history of Cult Wines and follow that up, please, with what is unique about Cult Wines as a company? Why do you love it so much? Sure. Um, well, thank you. Yes. Uh, Cult Wines was uh, founded in 2009 in London, UK. Um, so we have a, a good track record of performance and uh, uh, delivery to, to our clients. Um, we're the world's largest asset manager of fine wine uh, with about $325 million uh, worth of fine wine assets uh, under management. Um, we have six offices globally and about 80 people on the team around the world. Um, what makes us different is, first of all, our longevity. Um, we've been doing this for a long time. Secondly, it's the uh, perfect marriage, I think, uh, between individuals who are very uh, accomplished in the investment management space, together with um, individuals who are very accomplished in the fine wine space. And in some cases, uh, some people have both sets of expertise. So um, we approach it with a degree of investment rigor. We have an investment committee, a uh, global one of which I'm a part of. And um, we really uh, uh, focus on uh, earning the best possible returns <clears throat> for our clients. Now, I read somewhere that you use artificial intelligence to determine the best investments for your clients. Can you talk about that a little bit? I find that really fascinating. Yes, I sure can. It's, um, uh, <clears throat> it is a, a quantitative process that we take. We do have a number of models that we use with a number of different factor inputs, things like um, price history, uh, performance of the brand, uh, weather, you know, how is, is the climate going to impact this vintage? Um, what are the critics ratings? Uh, you know, when will they re-rate the wines? We have to be on top of all of those things. Um, so we do uh, have six models um, and we have introduced some machine learning into those models to help us get that quantitative edge when we um, manage our clients' portfolios. Now, although we do use a lot of uh, quantitative data and some machine learning, uh, we can't forget about the human element. And so that's where the investment committee comes in. We meet four times a year uh, minimum, and uh, we'll exercise some of that human uh, fundamental overlay judgment on what the machines and data are telling us. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, wine is still uh, a precious commodity that, uh, as you've mentioned, you know, you love to enjoy, you love to drink, you love to share with friends and, and talk about. And so we can't lose sight of that part of uh, a fine wine. Fantastic. So can you tell us a little bit about why someone should consider fine wine as an investment? Sure. And so this will get into the, uh, the, the investment merits of fine wine, of which there are many. Um, you know, it all starts with supply and demand. So uh, we'd estimate there's probably about $450 billion worth of wine made every year, every vintage. Of that, probably only about 1% would be investment grade or wow. fine wine that, that we would invest in. So that's about four and a half billion. Um, as you know, as fine wine ages, it gets consumed around the world. And so as long as the demand is still there, and in fact, in, when it comes to fine wine, it's growing because wealth around the world is increasing. More countries that previously may not have had a, a fine wine culture are, are developing them. So as the supply goes down, demand goes up, it's basic economics, price goes up. And so, so that's where you start. Um, and then the other uh, characteristics from an investment standpoint in wine are that it's very low correlation 
to equity markets, um, low volatility, and uh, is a great hedge against inflation in these times. Uh, and then of course, there's uh, what the investment uh, people would say is a low downside capture. What that means is when the equity markets are crashing, wine will not go down as much and in fact may appreciate. And we're seeing that this year with um, year-to-date returns of the LiveX 1000 index of fine wine uh, at the end of June, we're 11.1% positive. And the S&P 500 was 21% negative. So that's a 32% difference. So it seems like it has an inverse relationship. Is that correct? It is currently. Um, but when, yes. And, and when you look at um, the global fiscal crisis um, in the year 2008, um, yes. the S&P was down 36% and the fine wine index was down less than 1%. So it was still negative, but only slightly negative uh, during that time. So very low volatility. So can you talk about how the uh, fine wine has done, say, in the last 10 years as an asset class? And you mentioned it's increased so far this year. Where do you see the projection going? Do you see it continuing to increase? Right. So uh, the, when you take the accepted index, which is the LiveX 1000, I can talk a little bit about how that um, is, is structured, if you like. I would like that after, but that'll, that could be our next question. Yes. Okay, great. Well, I won't jump ahead on that one. Um, it, the LiveX 1000 over the past 10 years has returned 92%. So, you know, it, it's about, a, and that's in um, pounds sterling in, in great British pounds. So about a 9% annualized, let's call it uh, 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 return. So, so those are good returns when you combine that with the other portfolio diversification benefits of fine wine. Um, so uh, last year was a very good year. The index was up 21%. Um, and as I mentioned, the first six months of this year, it's up another 11%. So we're seeing some good returns. And um, as a company, uh, Cult Wines, we would look ahead to the next few quarters and would say, you know, there is a, obviously a risk of recession through a number of economies. Um, we think that the returns may moderate. Um, we don't see them you know, going negative, certainly not in a, in a large way like we've seen the S&P 500 do. Um, and we would say uh, the way that we're managing our portfolios is on a selective basis. So certain regions like Burgundy have uh, very much outperformed over the last few years. So in that region, we would focus our, our um, picks into maybe some of the secondary wines and the up and comers. Um, and we'd also say, you know, might not be a bad time to look at Italy and Rome once again. Now, the benchmark comparable to the S&P 500 is the Live X. That's it, yes. Um, Can you talk about that a little bit? How many wines are traded on it? Um, and, and then how is Cult Wines doing in relation to the general market? Sure. Um, so LiveX is a, it's essentially an exchange for wine. Uh, it's not a stock exchange, but I like to call it one um, because there's over 500 uh, participants in the exchange globally. And it it's, was started in London in the year 2000. So every day, all day, 500 plus professionals are making markets in every fine wine imaginable. So what you're getting there is independent pricing, which is, which is really important when you're looking at alternative assets, because sometimes it's very hard to value them. In this case, uh, you get a daily price that is a real price um, for your fine wine investment. So that's great. Um, so LiveX publishes benchmarks um, and will update them uh, every month and, and posts it on their website. Uh, and there are a number of them. What we use um, in our uh, processes is called the LiveX 1000. And it's an index that basically tracks the 1000 uh, most traded wines in the world. And then it's, it's aggregated into an index format. So that's what that is. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, over the 10-year the period, it was a 92% return in that index. 
Um, cult wines, you asked about our performance over that same period, um, our index, which is basically an aggregation of all of the portfolios that we manage, uh, returned about 85%. Um, so pretty close, uh, but you also have to keep in mind that the LiveX 1000 really isn't investable. Um, it, it's not practicable to go out and buy 1000 wines in case format and store them and insure them and, and trade them. So that's really, it is a guideline, it's a benchmark. Um, and uh, our performance uh, over that same period has is, is been pretty close to, to the LiveX. What's the typical hold time for, for wine? We, when we speak to clients, we, we um, counsel them to think of each position as about a three to five year hold, um, and ideally five years. Uh, now, we don't have any lockup periods. So if you're a client and you need to or want to sell in your first year, you can do that for sure. Um, but we do say in order to reap the benefits of fine wine investing, it, it takes a bit of time because of what we had talked about earlier, the consumption element. So you want to give wine the opportunity to appreciate as consumption around the world decreases the number of bottles of that particular wine are, that are in circulation. So um, you'll see fine wine tends to appreciate for a period of time, it plateaus, appreciates again, plateaus. And so our job is to manage our portfolios in a way that we take advantage of uh, the price rises, uh, but also we're mindful not to hold the wine for too long because there isn't uh, a risk reward benefit to holding wine for too long. So that's part of the, the active management we perform. Understood. Now, you mentioned 1% of fine wines actually of the entire market is investable. So that's, that's uh, very few wines making the cut. What criteria do you guys use to pick wines? What do you look at? There, there isn't really an accepted um, definition of an investment wine. And so you're right. We have to consider a number of different factors when we decide whether a particular wine um, should go into the investment portfolios. Um, we, I, I think I mentioned earlier, there's, there's a number of factors we consider such as um, you know, the producer's reputation, previous history of, of prices and performance, um, critic ratings, vintage ratings. So a number of those elements go into that decision. Um, but I think to generalize, you would say two things make a wine an investment grade wine. Number one uh, is scarcity. So uh, for the most part, investment grade wines are made in smaller quantities for the most part, with some mm -hmm. exceptions. Um, but that obviously helps right away in that supply demand dynamic. The second thing is fine wines that you invest in should have ability to age. Um, and so you wouldn't be investing in wines that, uh, you know, you, you go to your, your local and, and pick it up and, and Pop, pop the cork or the, the screw, screw top that night for your, for your um, salad or your barbecue. Um, a, a lot of these wines, as you know, being a, a wine connoisseur, you know, can age to perfection 20 to 30 years from now. Absolutely. So, right. So that longevity is important when you consider um, whether it's investment worthy. Now, you mentioned the Burgundy region. What other regions do you guys look into and invest in? or pick your wines from, that's a better way of phrasing that. <laughs> yeah, um, just like any other investment, um, in addition to talking to clients about uh, realistic views on, on their whole periods, uh, we also talk about diversification. Uh, just as you would talk to anybody who is investing in equities and bonds, it's very important to diversify by geography, you know, by sector, uh, mm -hmm. by duration, all of those things uh, go towards making a healthy portfolio. It's the same with wine. So our investment committee meets every quarter and looks at our benchmark allocation and may make adjustments. And then we make those same adjustments in our client portfolios. Um, 
So to answer your question, um, the, the history of fine wine has been centered in London because that's where the broadest and deepest, most liquid market for fine wine is. Okay. And it's closely followed by Hong Kong as, oh, as a okay. deep market. Um, and so naturally having started really in, in the English markets, there is um, uh, definitely a skew towards European wines. And so when you look at trading on the LiveX, um, you know, the, the, until recently in the last couple of years, the vast majority of trades on the LiveX were with Bordeaux. Um, recently, Burgundy's uh, catching up and we're seeing a lot more trading in uh, Italian wine and American wine, which is uh, great to see. Um, so, so right now, our benchmark allocation is probably about uh, still 80% uh, French wines made up of uh, about equal parts of Burgundy and, and Bordeaux and a 10% to 13% weight to Champagne, uh, about 10% to Italy, and the rest being allocated to uh, U.S. wines, some German wines, Spanish wines, and then uh, a few Chileans and Australians. In terms of U.S. wines, are the Napa fires affecting the price of, of the wines? Did they affect last year's fires? And obviously we will probably, I hate to say it, have more fires coming up. Yeah. The, what kind uh, of effect has that had? Right, yeah, climate change is a big issue uh, for sure. And uh, even just weather events, uh, like you say, the, the dryness that's creating the wildfires. Um, the answer is yes, short answer is yes. Um, all of those, uh, all of those events um, are unfortunately negative for wine consumers uh, because obviously it decreases uh, supply. And so when you have a decrease in supply and still good quality, you have an increase in price because uh, there's just not enough to go around to, to meet demand. Um, on the flip side of it, if you become an investor, uh, it's good for your portfolio in the sense that the, the reduced supply, again, increases demand. Generally, you'll see price appreciation. So um, the answer is yes. And um, in fact, California over the last year and a half has been, um, I think, the third leading uh, area in terms of investment returns uh, behind, Bord uh, behind um, Burgundy and Champagne. So um, we're seeing... Uh, price appreciation in, in the iconics like Screaming Eagle and Harlan and Opus and, and others. Right, right. Now, if someone say came to you with $25,000, $30,000, can you walk us through what that process would look like? You mentioned the investment team getting together with the clients. What does that involve? Right, yeah, so at the, um, the $30,000 level, um, you would come in to Cult Wines. Uh, you would uh, book a consultation with a portfolio manager. And the portfolio manager would take you through the Know Your Client questionnaire. Of course. To, I'm sure you're very familiar with those. <laughs> um, get to understand your objectives um, and your time horizon, your risk uh, profile, all of those things that would happen in any other investment. Um, from there, uh, we will match a wine portfolio with your objectives. And so it's important to know that when you become a client of Cult Wines, what you get is a segregated, separately managed account of fine wine. So you actually own the wine. Um, and what we do is we acquire the wine, we transport it, we store it in perfect conditions with a third party, um, we insure it. And then we will actively manage your portfolio. We don't charge any performance fees and we don't charge any commissions on, on sales when you exit positions. Um, so basically you would have access to your portfolio manager at any time. Um, we'll perform um, reviews of your portfolio uh, on a frequency that you would like. And so, it's like, so it's like working with any wealth manager or financial advisor. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. That's right, yes. Now you mentioned storage. Where are these wines stored? 
The vast majority of our wines are stored um, in the UK uh, with uh, a third party called London City Bond. And London City Bond is an expert in uh, storage of wine. Uh, they have 2 million square feet of warehousing in the UK, 8 million cases wow. of wine. Um, and uh, they keep track of all of this inventory. Um, they make sure that it is segregated by client, by law. Uh, and then they register the uh, cases of wine with the UK revenue authorities. And the so reason- So it's regulated. It, in that sense, yes. In that and sense. The, yep, and the reason why we hold it with London City Bond is because their warehouse network is considered to be what is called in bond storage. And what that means is when we buy our wines in Bordeaux and Burgundy and Italy and bring them in and consolidate in our storage facilities, they don't attract the 20% VAT tax. So as an investor, uh. right? As an investor, you're, you're better off day one. Um, and the VAT tax is only paid to the UK revenue authorities when the wine is withdrawn from the in-bond system. So, Regardless of where the client lives, they have to pay that VAT tax. Is that correct? Yes, for the most part, there's some exemptions, but uh, for the most part, yes. Okay. Now, can you talk about some of the risks that come with investing in fine wine? There's got to be some. <laughs> with, uh, with reward always comes risk, right? Absolutely. <laughs> um, yes, uh, sure. You know, there's obviously... Um, there's a few things, if, if you were an investor considering a fine wine investment, obviously there are some things you need to um, do some due diligence on. So uh, number one, I would say, obviously research the company, um, make sure that in fact, they do really have experience on the investment side and not just on the wine side, because um, it's important that there is that balance. And you should also look at the track record and history of um, performance. And so for us, when, when we can show that we've uh, been in business since 2009, um, you know, we have 3000 clients globally, um, all of those things uh, go towards mitigating some of that risk of, you know, not having somebody with experience managing your account. Secondly, um, I talked about acquiring. So since, since it's a physical commodity, you need to make sure that the people you're investing with have access to wines um, at good prices. Um, and a lot of that comes from developing strong relationships over the years with producers where you can get the allocations direct from producer. Um, that helps with pricing. The other thing it helps with is to uh, help prevent fraud. And uh, so unfortunately, yes, fraud is an issue as, as many of you will have seen sour grapes on, uh, on Netflix. Uh, and so it, it's something you need to be careful about. And we are extremely careful um, to ensure the provenance and authenticity of our wines. Um, in fact, we have over a million, million and a half uh, bottles of wine right now in our care, and we've never had a, a, a complaint or incident of a fraudulent bottle. So you really have to make sure that the company is on top of that. Um, and then uh, finally, I would say insurance. You know, you just want to make sure that the insurance coverage for your investment uh, is appropriate. So those would be some of the things uh, you should look out for if you're considering a wine investment. Excellent. So that's your personal advice to first-time investors. I love that. Thank yes. you for that. Now, we've been talking about loving wine and passion for wine. It's, it's like art, you know, there's that debate, love, passion, not love, don't have passion. Um, should we invest in wine for love or money or both? What, what do you suggest? <laughs> Let's have a little debate before we close off. <laughs> sure. That's a tough question. Actually. That's a tough question. Um, I, it's a, there's a passion to fine wine. And so our investors run the gamut. We have people who are high-end noted collectors who have giant collections of their own, but come to us and say like, look, it's a hard thing to do on your own. All of those elements of acquiring and storing and insuring and exiting, it's, it's daunting. 
Um, so they say, look, I, we've got this portfolio at home, which is for us to drink and enjoy with our friends and family. You manage it uh, portfolio for us for money. So, you know, you can have both. Um, we also have clients who don't drink and they just look at the investment merits and say, this is a good investment, I'm in. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of people in between who are maybe new to wine or they've, they've enjoyed wine for three, five years and they want to get deeper into it. And that's where the other part of what we do comes in. Um, on our website, we've got you know, a great section on education. Um, we do webinars. We'll do tastings. Um, you know, all of that, I think, because wine is such a special thing, um, you want to make sure that you don't take the passion out of it. Uh, by purely focusing on the numbers, right? So we kind of call it the head and the heart. The head is the numbers and the return. The heart is the enjoyment and learning more about um, uh, the, the, the people who you know, are essentially farmers growing the grapes and making this wonderful bottle of, of wine that you're having at your table. I mean, uh, you know, there's a romance to it that you, you can't lose. Fantastic. Atoll, you have been so helpful. This has been such a valuable and informative uh, session. Thank you so much. Is there anything you would like to add that I haven't mentioned that you'd like to say to our listeners? Gosh, I would, you know, but not, not really. I would just add one more element, which is, um, you know, the, the wine world is, um, uh, as, as you know, Aisha, from, from being in, in it yourself, um, you know, it's traditionally been you know, uh, not a very diverse um, world. And, uh, <laughs> and gaining uh, popularity, definitely. Sure is, uh, you know, just look at the two of us, right? Um, the, um, the fact is, part of what we want to do on the education side, of course, is, is also bring more inclusivity uh, to the space. And, um, you know, we do uh, try to um, uh, encourage more uh, BIPOC uh, individuals and women to engage with wine, learn about wine, be comfortable with it. And ultimately, if they feel like investing is, is for them, invest in it. Um, we want to democratize the space and bring more people to it, um, which is part of, uh, of uh, why we're uh, you know, broadening out our, our investment levels to $10,000. So it, it increases um, at least some uh, accessibility to it. Um, and uh, the other thing is because it's, it's a bit of an archaic area uh, and opaque, um, we're also utilizing technology in ways that others aren't. And so our entire inventory is blockchained now, and um, we've got a number of initiatives underway. We did an NFT last year on a wine experience, a barrel of wine at uh, Chateau Angelus. Wow. Um, that, uh, that the winning bidder got, yeah. Um, and uh, soon we'll be launching uh, what we call Cultex, which will be a trading app to allow people who want to trade a bit more frequently or build collections uh, digitally um, to do so. So lots of fun stuff coming, uh, coming in the future. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Atoll. Really appreciate, we really appreciated having you. Thank you. And, and thanks to everyone who's uh, listening.